Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So take a look at this, guys. It looks like Naib Kelly has bought the dip. El Salvador bought today 80 Bitcoin at $19,000 each. And uh, here's the order book just uh, confirming those transactions on June the 30th, which was just yesterday. I mean, Bitcoin has just been vacillating now, just kind of trying to find its equilibrium. Right now, Bitcoin is trading at about $19,000. You guys can see over the last couple of days, we have seen some erratic movement for Bitcoin with those uh, long wicks and long tails on those candlesticks. Let me throw that on the hourly. You can probably see that a little better there. So uh, a pop to the upside, uh, back up to almost $21,000. And then the sell order is coming in, bringing it right back down to nine eighteen thousand dollars per coin so market not looking too hot right now uh 872 billion dollars bitcoin dominance still holding though um market as of the time of this recording up a little bit you guys can see bitcoin's up uh just a smidge 0.1 percent ethereum is up almost uh two percent here we've got xrp up 1.42 percent so you know the crypto market doing what it is doing and uh you know we've been getting some conflicting news coming out of the crypto space a lot of rumors are flying around and um a couple of stories were published but then it came out that uh these stories weren't actually true like ftx close to buying block five for just 25 million dollars uh, the beleaguered crypto lender was reportedly close to finalizing a down round, valuing it at $1 billion earlier this month. And uh, so they're saying here, at least it was reported originally, I think back uh, yesterday afternoon at around 2 p.m. that uh, they were going to be sold. But then the article was later updated at around 5 p.m. And so here was the tweet from Zach Prince. Lots of market rumors out there. I can 100% confirm that we are not being sold for $25 million. I encourage everyone to trust only D details that you hear directly from BlockFi. We will share more with you as soon as we can. And BlockFi is not the only company. I mean, we've been hearing lots of rumors out there. Uh, I saw this from Watcher Guru as well. Coinbase is reportedly selling user data to U.S. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Agency, including historical geodata and transaction history. So this was uh, also something that was published yesterday, according to a contract obtained by Jack Polson, director of Tech Inquiry. The information will include historical geo-tracking data and transaction history. The data will particularly help uh, identify crypto users and investors. Additionally, thanks to added material in the contract, the United States uh, Department of Homeland Security's powers will be enhanced. So they are suggesting here that Coinbase selling out their users using their data, or rather uh, selling their data. All Coinbase Tracer features uh, use data that is fully sourced from online public available, or rather, sorry, publicly available data, and do not include any personal identifiable information for anyone or any proprietary Coinbase user data. So that was just a quote here, I guess, alleviating some people's concerns that maybe their name and address would be <laughs> disclosed. Uh, however, Coinbase has also now come out and said, we want to make this incredibly clear. Coinbase does not sell proprietary customer data. Our first concern has always been and always will be providing the safest and most secure crypto experience to our users. Our Coinbase tracer tools are designed to supply or rather to support compliance and help investigate financial crimes like money laundering and terrorist financing. Coinbase tracer sources its information from public sources and does not make use of Coinbase user data ever. So, you know, some people down here in the thread saying, you know, like Mr. Use Case, yeah, nobody believes you. Uh, Dictator Know-It-All saying, you know, they ain't lying if they are eventually giving it away for free. Good point there. But I'm surprised. I mean, lots of stories here, or rather two stories, two prominent stories that um, are actually being proven to be categorically false. Yet they have been published. So, um, you know, it's an interesting time in the crypto space. I think a lot of FUD is being spread on purpose, probably to drum up just that fear uncertainty and doubt within retail traders, getting the last portion of us to dump our crypto at these extremely low prices. Um, so Bitcoin trading at about 19,000. Let me just bring up XRP real quickly here. XRP just trading above 31 cents at this moment in time too. You can see some volatility there for XRP over the last few hours as well. That move up along with the Bitcoin trend back up to 33 and a half cents and now back down to uh, about 0.313. So, um, you know, tumultuous to say the least. Um, we're also seeing news coming out of the Fed today. The Fed is to delay the implementation of the new ISO 20022 payment messaging format by two years to 2025. 
So we know 2025 was kind of that absolute end date, but um, they had initially set the deadline to be November 2023. The Fed had previously set the deadline for November 2023 for a cutover to the extended payment messaging format in line with its implementation by SWIFT and other global money transfer networks. The agency says that it will instead opt for a one-day cutover uh, on, on March 10th, 2025. The Fed says the revisited timeline uh, is in response to bank concerns uh, that it was prioritizing the introduction of the new messaging format to the detriment of the rollout of the FedNow real-time transfer network, which is also set to debut in November, I believe this is supposed to say 2023, not 2003, uh, as well as shifting the deadline, the central bank has also set out a revisited testing strategy to help banks to stagger workloads and alleviate resource constraints. Here's a quote, guys. The board believes that shifting the implementation date for the migration of the Fedwire fund service to the ISO 20022 format to March 2025, rather than November 2023, as proposed, should mitigate commenters' concerns regarding resource constraints in light of the launch of the new FedNow service, the Fed board says. So they've got their reasons why they are doing that. Um, I'm sure in a lot of ways they weren't uh, expecting um, for the economy to be unraveling, uh, I guess, maybe at the pace that it is, or, you know, maybe there are some aspects of this that they weren't anticipating. Maybe the technology really isn't up to snuff as of yet, at least in some capacities. Maybe they feel like they need to keep trialing for whatever reason, considering RippleNet and XRP are part of the Fed Wire or the Fed Now system. Maybe they were feeling they needed to do more tests at scale, uh, perhaps in order to uh, fully be confident in the XRPL's abilities. Uh, anyway, that is the news there, 2025, the new date. Meanwhile, though, Ripple partner Finastra has announced some new news, this courtesy of Mike Manfield here on Twitter. Finastra today unveiled its embedded customer lending solution, enabling access to traditional regulated lending options for customers at point of sale. Financial institutions, distributors, and merchants will benefit from a platform that makes it easy for their customers to access lending options. For end customers, Finastra embedded customer lending aims to make the buying process as frictionless as possible, providing more options to consumers and an alternative to the buy now, pay later approach which is often not applicable to high-value purchases. Here's a quote from management. Finastra's embedded customer lending solution offers financial institutions a direct route to growth by offering loans via a merchant's digital point of sale. Uh, the solution builds connectivity and relationships between financial institutions and the distributor organizations that embed lending solutions at merchant's point of sale. Uh, and then we also have a quote here from Josh Williams, EVP, Chief Banking Officer at Seattle Bank. He said, banking as a service or BAAS uh, is a a vital component to our growth strategy and embedding loans at the customer's point of sale opens up a new channel to provide financing to customers we couldn't have reached before. This cost-effective solution delivers customers a safer, regulated alternative when it comes to POS financing. As our trusted partner for many years, Finastra is the ideal orchestrator as we connect and scale on our embedded finance offering. So at this case, customer lending at the point of sale. Also note down here, uh, there's another partnership linked to RippleNet integrated with Finastra's lending and uh, origination core systems and hosted on Microsoft Azure. So I believe there's a RippleNet connection too to Microsoft Azure. Finastra, obviously uh, one of the big ones uh, looking to onboard more customers with new products. Of course, we know that uh, the tokenization of everything will occur over this coming decade. So running on the blockchain, that is going to be the standard at a certain point. And so it's great to see these uh, Ripple partners onboarding new clients likely going to add more value to the XRPL over time. So I wanted to thank Mike for posting that. And here's one, guys, from the Wrath of Kahneman. Ripple partner Fleet Core's CorePay cross-border has partnered with Triteras to utilize CorePay's innovative solutions to help mitigate foreign exchange exposure for their day-to-day -day business needs. We just talked about Fleet Core the other day. Well, uh, it looks like they are racking up the partnerships. CorePay, a Fleet Core brand and global leader in business payments, and Teritas, or Triteras, excuse me, a global fintech company and leading innovator of inclusive finance solutions for the world's micro, small, and medium enterprises, are pleased to announce a new collaboration between the companies. Through this collaboration, their members can gain access to and utilize CorePay's innovative solutions to help mitigate foreign exchange exposure for their day-to-day -day business needs. Additionally, Corp 
Pay's cross-border award-winning platform will enable both Triteris and Kratos members to manage their global payments from a single point of access. So cross-border payments, streamlining it, obviously making it more uh, seamless, a lot more efficient for their clients. Clients who choose CorePay with their global payments and foreign exchange currency transactions will undergo CorePay's cross-border onboarding process, which includes, but is not limited to, due diligence checks, so KYC procedures. Uh, and here's a quote, guys. We're very excited to onboard Treacherous uh, as a new customer, as well as our new partner. I am confident that both Treacherous and Kratos Plus platform members looking to better streamline their payment processes and effectively manage their FX exposure will benefit from access to our comprehensive cross-border payments and currency risk management solutions. This coming from David Britton, Managing Director of uh, APAC CorePay Cross-Border. Our team in APAC looks forward to helping these enterprises power their cross-border payments, execute plans to manage their currency risk, and support their aspirations to grow their business globally. And then just down here, a little more information about CorePay and about Triteris or Triteris. I don't know how you pronounce that. Nevertheless, more Ripple partnerships, beginning partnerships in that same industry and by extension will add value, more value to the XRPL over time. So interesting move there. Wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. And Crypto Eddie here on Twitter posted this. For many reasons, I find this clip curious. The former CEO of Swift, Gottfried Liebrandt, who served in that capacity from 2015 to 2019. And here's what his prediction was for the future of cryptocurrency, guys. Now, we've got to remember way back when, three years ago, he was on a panel with Brad Garlinghouse. This is when he was still at Swift. So um, I'm going to play you guys this clip in a second, but Gottfried Liebrandt, uh, at this point in time, he was no longer with Swift. But over here back in January of 2019, I believe that's when the Paris FinTech Forum uh, occurred, he was on a panel with Brad Garlinghouse. I remember reporting on this at that time. This is when Brad Garlinghouse actually called Swift's API uh, basically a Ferrari shell on a T-Engine Ford model. And so here's just a little clip first of Brad just kind of uh, setting up the scene, setting up the stage. Remember, this is uh, even before XRapid had been released from RippleNet. That's the product that was later labeled OD on-demand liquidity. So this is what Brad had to say. Well, I think we are moving into a new world order. I whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all, what? A new world what, Brad? <laughs> I think the internet of value, uh, you know, Ripple talks a lot about what payments look like, not just, you know, today, but in 10, 20 years. And when we think about that, we talk about this internet of value. How do we let value move the way information moves today? Uh, I think about the, the dynamic between Ripple and Swift, not dissimilar to the dynamic between, you know, when Amazon in 1997, 1998, and you got Walmart. Uh, and, you know, I, certainly it's a David and Goliath kind of classic story. I, I think that the challenge is you're dealing with, when, when Ripple thinks about the future of the Internet of Value, really democratizing payments, reducing costs dramatically, increasing speed dramatically, we're really thinking about it the same way we introduced new technologies like TCP IP and HTTP that became the Internet of Information. You know, when we talk about what the SWIFT network is today, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a closed network. It has a lot of members on it for sure, but AOL had a lot of members. And when we moved into the age of the Internet at a decentralized, democratic uh, network, uh, I think that you, what you're seeing introduced with blockchain technologies, and it's, by the way, it's not just Ripple. When we think about interoperability, we think about interoperability between many blockchains. And uh, you know, I, I think that the, the future we see is uh, certainly you know, one of many networks, interoperable networks, and reducing the friction of those payments to close to zero. And I think you're going to see a lot of innovation spawn from that part from Ripple and part from a, an entire ecosystem. Okay, so I'm going to leave that clip there. Essentially, Brad Garlinghouse, uh, you know, talking about RippleNet. This was still when it was fairly new and um, Ripple was still trying to onboard clients, new banks, uh, you know, banks were getting their toes wet with blockchain technology, DLT. So you got to you gotta kind of put yourself back three years, three and a half years and, and kind of put yourself in a headspace of crypto, an emerging asset, very different than it is today. And so Gottfried Liebrandt responding a little bit later in the conversation. Gottfried, how do you feel about a partnership with Ripple? Well, first, we can negotiate it here. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, maybe a couple. One is um, there's two types of competition, I think. The, the one is between the bank centric model, and then there's lots of people who are trying to build cross border payments outside of the bank system. And that's, that's an interesting one to watch. And, and there you could see a, a shift in, in paradigm. 
I do think that there will, going forward, be a crucial role for banks. There's a reason we have banks, there's a reason they're regulated and all of that. So I, I don't see the role of banks going away if they innovate fast enough, which they, I think, uh, appear, to be, uh, appear to be doing. So it's the banks uh, to lose. Um, so from that perspective, um, we, uh, we are on the same, on the same boat of, being, of having a, a bank-centric uh, model. In terms of one of the exciting things about the new GPI platform is the, the fact that it is extremely interoperable and, and open, and we've always had links to other networks. We're going to enhance that with API access. Um, we are uh, announcing, I think, uh, later today, a proof of concept with uh, R3, uh, an R3 uh, blockchain on trade, where you can initiate a payment on the trade platform, and then it goes into, uh, into GPI. Um, so we are we're exploring interconnectivity with a lot of things, and, and Banks have always been about that, uh, that interconnectivity. Uh, right now, you can, I mean, to some extent, you can already do that. Eh? If Santander is on Swift as well, so they can act as the, the peering point between the, between the two, uh, two new networks. So the last thing we want to be is a closed system. I think the world belongs to open systems uh, going forward. Um, and that's, that's I mean, another interesting example is um, in a lot of countries, we now see real-time systems uh, emerging, domestic real-time systems, uh, several of them on the SWIFT network. We, we, in Australia, they went live last year with the Australia new payment platform, real-time, domestic, um, that runs on our rails in, uh, in Australia. And we are now um, working with four countries in Southeast Asia to interconnect the real-time systems that they have there using GPI as the glue between them. So essentially, you go from country to country, leveraging both the domestic real-time rails and the cross-border uh, GPI. The other thing that excites me about it is um, I firmly expect that within a few years, GPI will be de facto real-time uh, cross-border. <laughs> I expect GPI will be the de facto real-time cross-border settlement system. You can see here how back in 2019, Librant was really trying to convince um, you know, the public that their SWIFT GPI system was in real time. Now, let's differentiate not real time settlement, maybe real time payment, but not real time settlement, but obviously a very inferior system. You can see that he was uh, on the same page as Brad Garling. I was saying, you know, there still will be banks, but there is going to be a need for a new solution. Uh, banks need to innovate if they want to keep relevant. Well, how did banks decide to innovate? More and more banks, fast forward to, you know, 2022, more and more banks decided to go with DLT technology, many of them already partnering with RippleNet. At this point in time, I think Ripple only had about 100 plus partners. Now they have over 350, and I'm sure by now that number is even larger. And if you remember, guys, Ashish Birla said this just last month or a couple of months ago, it was May 2022. There's not another solution out there that does messaging and settlement instantly like Ripple. And so our solution is now a lot bigger than what Swift does. So, you know, you fast forward, GPI obviously still has not caught up with the Ripple network. As Gottfried Liebrandt was suggesting back in 2019 that it would eventually in a few years catch up to uh, RippleNet systems. So have they been left in the dust? Here's a clip from late last year, Gottfried Liebrandt on cryptocurrency. Listen to what he has to say. So what about crypto? We, we dedicate three chapters to it in the book. I have been fascinated with Bitcoin from the start. I found it genius, pure genius, the way it's engineered, the protocol that you can have a payment without anybody, any individual backing it, without a state behind it, and it purely relies on the math of the, of the crypto algorithms that, that drive it. The whole concept of mining, I think, is very cleverly engineered. So I've been fascinated from it, by it from the start. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen that it hasn't really broken through as a payment mechanism. I mean, Bitcoin is not accepted in a lot of places. Um, so it, it's proven a great store of value, if you will. It's a great replacement of gold. Whether that will last, we'll see. But, um, but it's not a great transaction uh, mechanism. Now, that could change if new technologies are introduced, other forms of crypto. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens if central banks throw their weight behind it. Will that make it a better transaction mechanisms with perhaps different technologies uh, behind it? I don't know. I'd like to think that um, it, it will challenge the banks. That's always good. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think the current payment system will sit still. And, and from a payments perspective, we've come a long way from a world where cross-border payments were almost impossible to make. The banking system is becoming real-time as we speak. So a lot of the problems that crypto tries to solve are being solved anyway. 
And so there you have it, Gottfried Liebrandt uh, going a little rogue since he's left Swift, saying Bitcoin, Bitcoin, okay, of all cryptocurrencies, is out to challenge banks. He talks a little bit about banking systems and transferring, and yet, as Panos points out, it's funny he doesn't even mention XRP, when back in 2013, he posted this, okay? This was a tweet from Gottfried Liebrandt back in 2013. Seems to me Ripple has just reinvented correspondent banking. Also just notes this uh, title here, how Ripple might avoid the Bitcoin fate. So even in 2013, Gottfried, you knew what you were peddling and uh you know despite the fact that when you were at swift you had to promote their gpi solution you had to toe the party line but i think it's clear your true colors are shining through he still doesn't mention xrp or the xrpl but it's interesting to note his opinions on cryptocurrency as a payment whether that's bitcoin if he's got a vested interest in bitcoin or not he does see cryptocurrency and blockchain technology at the forefront of payments, making a bit of a 180 on his 2019 statement. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.